Okay, hi everyone. I'm Sarah Marino and I live in southwestern Colorado for most of the year and then part time in our Airstream trailer where my husband Ron and I travel all across the American West, uh, mostly taking photos but also working from the road. Um, in terms of photography, I'm now a full time photographer as of this January and I focus on all sorts of photo education. So things like ebooks, video tutorials, workshops writing, all those sorts of things, um, and then composition. So really happy to be talking about composition today since I just yesterday released a new ebook on the topic, which I'll talk a little bit about later. So thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate you spending your afternoon with us or whatever time of day it is where uh, you are in the world. So thank you. Um, we can go on to the next person. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Jennifer. Um, so if you've attended these before, you probably know a little bit about me, but I'll just go over it real quick. So I'm originally from the Midwest. Um, I have a background in geology and I worked in veterinary medicine for 14 years. Um, the picture on the left there is me and actually one of our cats um, as she was waking up from anesthesia after I cleaned her teeth. Um, David and I travel together um, full time, although we've been a little off of that the last few months, understandably, in our four season travel trailer, which you can see in the middle picture there, and we travel around and teach workshops. Um, together we're exploring exposure, and together we're also the Nature Photographers Network. Um, and really, I mean, I just, I love photography, you know, I love nature, so I combined the two and set off on this journey about five years ago now. Um, and you can usually find my, find me in a spot with my lens pushed up against the rock like you see there in the canyon. That picture is actually courtesy from Sarah when, when we were together in Death Valley this winter. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited to do these webinars and see everyone and interact with everyone. And thank you for joining us. All right, hey everyone. I'm David Kingham and um, I've been a full-time photographer for about eight years now. I'm originally from Colorado, but as Jennifer said, we now travel in an RV and we're really excited to get back out on the road and start photographing again. And um, I run the site Exploring Exposure and with Jennifer where we have lots of educational material along with our photography workshops. And I, I also run the Nature Photographers Network, which I would highly recommend checking out if you're looking for a really great community of like-minded photographers and like to get images on your critiques. And um, I will just say, you need to check out Sarah's new ebook. She's going to undersell it, but I just yeah. went over it and it's phenomenal. You need to get this book. Highly recommend it. That was very nice of you to say. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so for our goals for today, uh, we want to take what is a sometimes nebulous concept and try to make it more practical. So when we're teaching workshops, this is sometimes one of the hardest things to work with people on because it's, it's hard to take really abstract ideas and analyze what you're trying to do with a scene and then put it into words and make it practical so you can learn from, from those uh, observations and design themes and other things that we're gonna talk about today. So our goal today is to really talk about some ideas that, that you can then use immediately in your own photography. Uh, we also have three different approaches. So even though our work is all somewhat similar in terms of the fact or we all focus on small scenes, we all enjoy photographing abstracts, we often all have our telephoto lenses out when we're in places together, but we all come at this topic from different ways. And so we wanted to talk about our own individual photographs and how composition individually comes out for each of us. So we'll ho we hope that by sharing three different perspectives that you'll maybe have some insights um, or see contrasts and then think, oh, that way works really well for me or this way works really well for me. So hopefully those three different perspectives will help you in your own learning. And then as I briefly mentioned before, we really hope that by talking, th talking through a lot of our photographs today, that you'll walk away with some really practical things that you can think about for your own work. So if you go out into your garden, garden or go to a park or go somewhere this weekend for photography, hopefully you can think through some of the ideas that we talk about um, in a way that helps elevate your own compositions. And before we get started, we should probably talk about what is composition. Uh, so we all, I think, work from a pretty similar definition that's pretty simple and 
I think it's, it's straightforward enough that you can understand it and apply it, which I think is helpful in our mutual goal of making this webinar really practical. Sometimes when you read things about composition, they're super basic, and then sometimes they're so complicated that it's hard to understand. So we're trying to get in the middle where simple, practical concepts um, can help you with your learning. So with that, we think of composition as, oh, do you wanna go back really quick, David? Sure. Um, we think of composition as the arrangement, interaction, and flow of elements within the four borders of your photographic frame. So if you wanna think about the three words at the beginning, so arrangement, interaction, and flow, all three of us are going to talk about those concepts and how they play out when we're working on a scene in the field. And then composition is really one of the most personal parts of photography. Uh, it's really the lens through which you see the world. So or, composition is an essential part of personal expression. And all three of us really see photography as an expressive medium. So our composition choices reflect the way that we see the world, how we interpret nature, the connections that we have when we're in a place, and then the visual preferences that we have. So uh, the, that will be another lens that we'll be talking about per, uh, for composition through today is personal expression. So with those things, that's a kind of an overview of the approach that we're taking to this topic today. And then we're each going to go through a presentation with some examples from our own portfolio, talking through how we see our own composition principles and how visual design elements play out. And then after the three of us go through our examples, we'll have time for questions at the end. So as Jennifer mentioned, you can type your questions in the Q&A as we're going. And then at the end, we'll get to, get to those um, after we all have a chance to present. All right, thanks, Sarah. So today, um, I wanna to talk to you about simplifying your compositions. And this is a really simple concept, but it's very hard to achieve because nature is so chaotic. Uh, painters have a really major advantage here because they can choose what they include or more importantly, what they exclude. And as photographers, we have to work with what we're presented with, but we can still choose what to include in the frame by using telephoto lenses or using light and elements like snow and fog to help simplify our compositions. So by taking things out that don't have anything to do with the subject or that are distracting attention away from the subject, you can distill your composition down to only the elements that need to be there. So you can do this by changing your viewpoint, by walking around your subject, move from left to right, up and down, or move closer or farther away. And you can also use different lenses. A telephoto is incredibly useful um, for simplifying by isolating your subject from extraneous elements that really distract the eye. So in this first example, we have a very simple pair of aspen trees that are being backlit by the first rays of morning light. And the light helped to simplify the scene by only having light on the top of the tree. So our eyes are naturally drawn to the highlights and it's really what's memorable about the image. But we also have a really nice foundation of shadows which helps to elevate the image. So here's a little bit of technical information, um, but I know, but know that it's not terribly important in this case because I just needed a good exposure that didn't clip the highlights on the tree where it was lit. So I was paying really close attention to my histogram to ensure that I was able to capture all the detail in those leaves. And this was at 220 millimeters, so just a normal telephoto length. I was on a tripod, which I used 90% of the time. It was a low ISO and at somewhat fast shutter speed to ensure that the leaves wouldn't be blurred from any slight movements. And an aperture of a f5.6. Um, which allowed me to get everything in focus because everything was so far away and the depth of field wasn't a major concern in this case. What was really important about this shot was catching that special moment of light just as the sun rose over the hill behind the tree, which lit up the leaves of this tree while leaving the background in shadow. So here's a slightly wider view of the scene to give you an idea of what was going on around the scene. 
and I wish I would have taken something a little bit wider to demonstrate this, but whatever. Um, there was a lot going on with all of these aspen trees that were beautifully backlit, and it was really over, overwhelming, which is often the case in nature. There are so many elements to look at that it can be hard to decide what to photograph. You want to get it all, so you end up getting out that wide angle to show the whole scene, but this just shows you a snapshot of the place. And I wanted to show something more personal and meaningful. So when evaluating a scene like this, it's important to slow down and ask yourself, what is it that is really captivating me? Then you can start that distillation process. Here I was attracted to this tree. I love the unique trunks that formed a triangle along with the leaves that appeared to be on fire almost. So I started playing around with different compositions and here I found a decent composition of this tree, but I found that the other lit leaves in the background to be a bit distracting and they're drawing attention away from the subject of these unique trees. And I also didn't like how only one of the trees appeared to be leaning from this angle. So it, it kind of lost a little bit of its uniqueness. And I also tried different perspectives. Um, this is from the side and I attempted to frame these really special trees with other aspens that were closer to me and by going a bit wider. And it's, it's important to move around and experiment and you'll create spectacular failures. And this is a great thing. If you're not failing, then you're not learning. And for me, the trees in the foreground really distract from the subject. It get, really gets lost in the clutter. So the answer to a good composition is usually making it more simple rather than trying to make it more complex. And the composition here is incredibly simple. We have a triangle and a bit of a circle on top. It kind of makes me want ice cream. Um, compositions don't always need to be complex and they don't have to follow the rules. Here I centered my subject and I think it works quite well. I tried other compositions on the thirds and it just didn't work for me. So I plopped it almost dead center. There are no rules in compositions, only ideas that you can learn from, but don't let them control you and your creative freedom. So the processing of this image was very important to simplify the composition even further. On the left, you can see the raw file and the background elements are extremely distracting and create a lot of chaos, which draws your eye away from the subject. And at first glance, this image might get passed right by, but I, I knew there was some potential there to be unlocked. And then on the right, you can see my developed settings in Lightroom. And you can see that I uh, lowered the exposure quite a bit and I raised the blacks so that my shadows retained detail and didn't go pure black. Then I raised the lights in the tone curve considerably, which brings up the mid-tone lights, which adds contrast without blowing out the highlights. And I was able to create really dramatic contrast without losing detail and maintaining really great tonality. So keep in mind that this is not a formula that will work for every image, but it did work for this one. So once I had a nice looking raw file, I needed to do some local adjustments to take away attention from distracting elements. So what is it that's distracting to my eye? Uh, so we've got uh, this trunk here is especially distracting to me. Um, sorry, some banging going on. <laughs> um, and it takes away from the triangle created by these angled trunks. So what I did to correct this was darken the trees in the background and also dodged or I brightened the angled trunks to give them separation. So here's the result. It's subtle but powerful to lead the eye exactly where you want it to go. So I'll go back and forth so you can see the difference. So that was before and that was after. So you can see how that helps create separation between the angled trees and the background, which is extremely important so your subject doesn't get lost in the forest, quite literally in this case. Uh, you do need to be careful when you do this so that it looks natural. 
if I were to put too much light on those trunks, it would look fake because there's obviously no light hitting them, but a slight amount remains believable. So for this next image um, is what I would consider a minimalist composition. The snow really helps to remove uh, most of the detail in the hillsides, leaving the, only the essential basic shapes of the rolling hills. I also process this very high key to remove further detail from the snow. And hopefully Zoom doesn't destroy this. There is a little bit of detail left in those hillsides. Then I also use negative space to emphasize my subject, which is this clump of trees. So negative space isn't a bad thing, it's just empty space. And that allows your subject to breathe and it gives it a sense of space. So I place the trees near the edge of the frame rather than at a third. And this further emphasizes the negative space, which is another great example of breaking these so-called rules with intention to emphasize the subject in the right scenario. So this was taken at 600 millimeters, which is quite the extreme telephoto length. It's something that I'm doing more and more to isolate faraway subjects. And while carrying around a 600 millimeter lens might sound crazy at first, there are plenty of great lenses these days that cover the 150 to 600 range. And they're reasonably priced and not incredibly large or heavy. So I had to take this image quickly before a snowplow forced us to move. So I was shooting handheld, but it was a bright overcast day. So even with a low ISO, my shutter speed was still a thousandth of a second and I was at F8. And I exposed this to the right so that the snow was the proper exposure while watching my histogram to ensure that it didn't clip. So here's a slightly wider view of the scene to show what I was working with. So after taking some mediocre images like this, I started to figure out what I wanted my subject to be, which was the trees against the rolling hills that were covered in snow. And I ultimately found my composition in this area, which is just out of the frame here. But this wasn't before testing out other compositions. Here, the dark area in the top right was distracting and it took away from that minimalist composition that I was going for. And the trees on each side of the frame felt a bit too symmetrical, which made it feel undynamic to me. So I wanted to show you some of the B-roll to prove that we all go through this process of taking mediocre or even bad images before landing on something that works well. And sometimes we never even find that image. So just know that we are human too, and we take lots of terrible photos. And then, as I said before, I intentionally process this image very high key to remove detail from the hillsides, leaving behind only the basic flowing shapes. So I did this all in Lightroom using very basic adjustments. My first step was raising the blacks all the way up to remove contrast and ensure that I had very soft shadows in the hillsides. I then raised the lights and the highlights in the tone curve. And this gave me most of the brightness in the image without clipping because the tone curve again works with the midtones. Um, but I also had to raise the whites to get nearly pure, the pure white that I was looking for. And I also dropped the shadows in the tone curve which, help, which helped to darken the trees while leaving everything else alone and not making them pure black. So don't be afraid to do a lot of experimentation when processing. With a lot of practice, you will figure out what works and what doesn't. So a great tool to help you visualize um, your composition is hidden in the spot removal tool in Lightroom. So this is the visualize spots tool, which enhances edges and contrast to help you see dust spots. But it's also great for seeing the structure of your composition because it simplifies it down to really basic elements. And this is especially helpful with really complex scenes. Now we can clearly see the basic elements of the composition. So here we have the dark mass of trees and the lines in the background make for a really dynamic composition that keeps the eyes engaged and flowing through the image. As a bonus, I wanted to give you a few small tips to help see small scenes when you're out in the field. 
So I know it can be really hard to see compositions when you're looking at a scene like this. It's really tempting to just use the wide angle to capture it all. And there's nothing wrong with that, but if you want to be a bit more creative and create small scenes from this vast scenic, you'll need to start isolating. And I found a good way to do this is by using what's called a view card. And film photographers have been using these for ages. And they traditionally would cut these from a piece of mat board and in the proportions of their film. And today there are fancier options like this one that's called the view catcher. And all you do with this is open it up to whatever aspect ratio you like and hold it out in front of you while only looking through the hole with one eye. And you can zoom by moving it closer or farther away from your eye. And you, you can also do this with your camera. Um, it's a, like a mid-range or a telephoto lens. But this gives you a bit more flexibility and freedom to try out these different compositions. So here's one of the many scenes that I found that night. And by using a view card or just a telephoto on camera and scanning the scene, you will start to notice the shapes and patterns that create a pleasing composition. So one problem with our eyes is that we see so much detail that it can overwhelm us from seeing the major shapes, which are really the most important part for creating a composition. So what I found useful is to either squint your eyes, or if you're looking through the viewfinder, you can manually defocus your lens so that the details are obscured. And this allows you to see the overall shapes and not get bogged down in the details, which are usually of secondary importance. So in this scene, we have some major line elements leading the composition into one central point. And then we have all of these secondary lines, which um, help push the eye even deeper into the scene, creating a really dynamic feel. And with that, I'm going to pass it off to Jennifer. Give me a minute here, everybody. I'm using something new today. So of course, you know, Murphy's Law. Well, I won't say that. I won't jinx myself. I'm just going to go. Let's see. Okay. How's that look? Okay, perfect. Woo, it worked. All right. So hi, everybody. Um, so now I'm going to show you three small scene composition case studies of mine. Um, these will show my thought process about how I approach the scene and the compositional elements that caught my eye in each. I'll also quickly go over the technical details, kind of like David did for the conditions um, that were, for the, the gear and the conditions, excuse me, that were occurring at each location. And I'll also show some alternative compositions and explain why I didn't end up using them to help kind of guide you guys from um, my whole process from start to finish with these case studies. So let's get started. So kind of a disclaimer, these case studies are not meant to be the end all be all of composition. We could sit here for days and talk about everything involved with composition. It's a very broad and deep topic. My goal is just to introduce you to some concepts that I use for the following photos and hopefully give you guys some ideas to look out for next time you're in the field. But first, a quick little glimpse into my composition style. So I like to think of the rules as tools. Um, I've always felt that rules inhibit creativity, apply pressure when out photographing. Um, and with that being said, I do believe understanding the fundamentals in the beginning when you're getting started is very beneficial. If you think about it like any other craft, um, I ride horses. I've ridden since I was six years old. Um, I didn't just hop on a horse and off I go. Um, I started with some lessons and some basic knowledge, and from there, I, I took it my own way. So just like any other sport or hobby um, or any new endeavor that you're doing, it's always good to start out with the fundamentals and at least just familiarize yourself with those. Um, so that'll kind of help you see why some compositions work and some don't. And then you have the tools in your mind to decide, do I want to, you know, maybe I want to follow this rule, but not really, but this composition kind of fits into that rule and you can just take it your own way. So I, I don't want you guys to think of the rules as the end all be all, you know, I have to follow this or the composition police are going to come get me. That's not it. But if you have a general fundamental understanding of maybe why your eyes are kind of going a certain way in a scene, that that's just a good thing to know. Um, 
So they're good to have in your mental toolbox, but don't live and die by them. Especially sometimes you'll have a photo that doesn't follow any rules, but it has special meaning to you or tells a story. So run with it. Um, I also like to keep things simple in the field and I break things down into simple shapes and concepts. I'm a very spatial person, so this kind of comes easy for me. I also like to work with different light and color contrast in the landscape, and you'll see that in a few of my studies here today. Um, I'm drawn to certain color combinations and I really enjoy using the light to develop compositions. I find that many of my photos involve curves and shapes and they guide the viewer through my photos. Um, sometimes taking a look at your collection of photos that you've taken, you'll sometimes see these themes kind of popping up and it's kind of good to do some of that self-reflection um, to see where your photography was, where you're going and where you want to be. And another thing, and this can be very hard when you're starting out, is to try not to think literally when you first survey the scene. I don't just see rocks, a river, and a tree, and so forth. Um, instead of rocks, I see circles. Instead of trees, I see triangles. Same thing with the mountains. Um, streams and rivers, I see, you know, fluid curves going through the scene instead of just what it is, a river. So composition is about finding a way to combine all these elements into a pleasing scene and not trying to think so literally. And if you've been attending these webinars, you know that I highly encourage you head out with an open mind. Um, we all three of us think that way, it's a common theme. And don't block yourself in with expectations from a scene. Um, instead, let nature guide your eye. So with that said, I'm going to dive into my first case study. So this is a photo from Death Valley, it's called Ambiance. So some location info, this is Death Valley National Park, California. Um, this was a very windy day. Um, it was super hazy because there were a lot of um, dust particles floating around and sand particles in the atmosphere, giving it kind of a soft box effect look. Um, and this was right before sunset, so right before the sun set behind the mountains behind these dunes. Technical details, I shoot with a Nikon D500. Um, my ISO was 100, this was at 250 millimeters. Um, I was at f8 and it was 1 60th of a second and definitely on a tripod, especially given the wind. So a few concepts for this particular scene. So some compositional elements that we see. We see some repetition, we see some shapes, see, sh wow, that's like one of those things, selling she sell, oh gosh, you know what I'm talking about. Goodness, seeing shapes, triangles, there we go, layers and complementary color contrasts. So the first thing I noticed about the scene was not just the dunes themselves, but I saw a few triangles. So these triangles were very symmetrical. I liked how they were kind of facing each other, and I particularly liked the main triangle sitting on top of the layers. Our eyes like symmetry in a scene. It gives a very harmonious feeling. Triangles also provide a sense of stability in the frame as well. So I also enjoyed the layers in these dunes with the repetition. So here we can see some nice flowing lines through here. And I liked that they were almost kind of intermixed with the triangles. And repetition and layers help keep the eyes moving throughout the scene and contributes to what we like to refer to as flow. So with our compositions, the main goal is we wanna keep our viewers' eyes in our scene. We don't wanna lead them out of the frame, above the frame. We wanna keep their eyes happy and kind of flowing to see everything that our frame has to offer. So there were also some lines coming in from the right and the left, and ultimately these kind of help guide your eye to the middle of the scene and then in an upward motion. So I liked how my eyes kind of floated in from each side and also rose up to see that pinnacle, which is the sand dune that commands its attention. And triangles, when they point up, they're very powerful. So think of that, you know, it's a good way to use triangles to point at things in your scene that you want to as well. And this image also contains my favorite color combination of warm and cool tones. So color may not usually be thought of as a lot, there's having a lot to do with composition, but colors can, can actually enhance a composition. Here the warm and blue create a very pleasing effect because they're complementary. They also act as a counterpoint in the scene because the eye is drawn back and forth between the highlights here in the atmosphere and the nice cool blue, sh blue shaded colors here in the dunes. So again, the counterpoint of that helps keep the eye moving throughout the frame. So I saw this alternative composition first while I was scanning the scene and I really liked it, especially with the layers. Um, this dune on the right though, which is ultimately the dune in the center of my final composition, 
it just felt a little unbalanced and it was a little too far off to the right and I just didn't like how close it was to the edge. So I eventually settled on this main, um, the final composition here. So this is the raw image and just like David had, here is all my info. Um, so I do very minimal processing or I try to, most of my stuff is in Lightroom and then I move on to Photoshop. So here, um, I, you can see that I brought my highlights down a little bit to really accentuate the warmer tones in the sky or the atmosphere, I should say. Um, I brought my whites up. That's something that I do to add contrast. You'll see in all my sliders, I do not touch my contrast slider in Lightroom. I use mostly my white slider. I'll, even if I have to bring my exposure down a little bit, I'll push it up with the white to create some of that contrast. And I brought my blacks down a little bit. You can see my curve, my tone curve didn't do too much there. And ideally I had a really, or I had a really nice histogram. So you can see it's centered there in the middle. Um, not a whole lot of contrast in the scene to begin with. So it was pretty easy to process. And my main goal was just to bring out those warms and those the warm tones and the blues. So here's the final image. Um, I did go into Photoshop afterwards and I just took care of that kind of odd horizon line that was there. Um, that's actually an alluvial fan in the background. And I removed a few dust spots, but that was the final image. Up next, we're gonna head to Colorado. This is my case study number two. This is called Good Morning. And this was in Crested Butte, Colorado on a clear morning with blue skies right after sunrise. This was right on the edge of an aspen forest with wildflowers in the meadow in the foreground. Um, same thing, same camera, ISO 400, 17 millimeters. And you'll see here that this is actually a departure from what I usually shoot with. This is a wide angle. And I wanted to throw this in here to show that you can do smaller scenes with a wide angle lens, um, just like you can with a telephoto lens. Um, for this scene especially, I just wanted to get down just a little bit lower. And the problem with telephoto lenses is sometimes they can compress your depth since they have a narrower field of view. So this, I wanted to keep my depth um, for my viewer. And so I shot with my, tele or my, excuse me, my wide angle lens. So that, that was at 17 millimeters. I was at f22. I stopped all the way down because I wanted to catch that sun star. When you line the sun up against the tree trunk or a hard surface, you can create those nice spikes in your camera by using anywhere from F18 to F22. This was 1 50th of a second and I was on my tripod. So this um, shows some concepts such as lines, vanishing point, diminishing scale and perspective, giving depth and complementary color contrast again. So you'll see some recurring themes here with my images. So the first thing that stands out in this scene are the lines. We have lines radiating out by the shadows um, from the trees. We also have vertical lines from the trunk themselves, the trunks themselves. And we also have the sun star, which has its own radiating lines, mimicking the lines from the shadows, creating a touch of symmetry. There is also a vanishing point. So this is referred to, or this is um, helpful in imagery because it actually gives the image depth. So if you've ever seen the pictures of the train tracks, you know, someone standing there, you know, looking onto the horizon, you'll notice the train tracks get super narrow as they go on. So that lets you know that that's further away in the scene. So that's kind of what I wanted to do here. So you know that the flowers in front are much closer to you, the flowers in the back are much further away from you. So it gives that sense of depth. We also, um, there's also a bit of an abstraction here. So the shadows from the trees kind of form a triangle, again, pointing up to the sun, leading your eye through the scene. And the flowers also have what we call diminishing scale. This again helps with depth and perspective. So the flowers are larger in the foreground compared to the flowers further away towards the trees. So again, this shows the viewer that the flowers, you know, kind of continue on toward the back of the frame and there's depth there and you know the flowers farther away or further away because they're smaller. So this was the only alternative composition that I was considering then. Um, I just didn't care for it because there was this big black shadow here. Um, it was really hard to balance that out. So I went for a portrait version and I was able to exclude that. So again, my raw image is on the left. You can see my histogram and you can see that because I'm at F22, it is pushed quite to the left. So I did bring up my shadows quite a bit in Lightroom. I took down my highlights. This is the final image in Lightroom after doing exactly what you see on the screen here. So bringing down the highlights really brought that blue sky back. So there we have those complementary colors. We've got the blue and the yellow, which is a very complementary um, grouping of colors. It's very nice to our eyes. Um, you can see I have a slight S in my tone curve. And yeah, that was pretty much all I did for here. Oh, and I brought up my shadows a little bit. 
And then in Photoshop, I went ahead and took it in there. There was a sun flare. I'm not sure if you could see it on the previous image kind of down here in the um, leaves. So I took care of that. And I also, going back, you can see there was a little distracting flower on the bottom of my frame. So I cloned him out as well. And that's the final image. Last study here. So this is an image called Embraced. So this was taken in the Badlands of Utah. This was during spring, during the wildflower season. So the little yellow channels that you see throughout the frame here, those are actually wildflowers growing. It was partly cloudy and this was photographed at sunset. Same camera, ISO was 400. Um, this was at 100 millimeters. My f-stop was 8.0 and this was at 1 50th of a second on a tripod. So this image here displays um, components such as curves, symmetry, leading lines, and complementary color contrast. So first we have symmetry from the ridges and the washes. So you can see here we kind of have a crescent shape here and a crescent shape there. And like I said earlier, you know, symmetry is very harmonious to our eyes. So I, you know, that really caught my attention. And then there are also some lines that lead you into the scene. So if you use those two curves that I had on before, you'll see there's a natural progression for your eye to kind of extend throughout the scene, follow this curve around, and eventually it kind of diminishes itself over here and there are some lines that kind of take your eye around and take you back around the frame and down the other side of the ridge. So I really wanted the viewer's eye to really travel the full length of this frame to appreciate the topography. And again, we have our complementary color contrast with the setting sun. There was some warm light here, blue shadows. Um, that was the other thing I really liked about this image was that this side of the ridge is bathed in warmth and the other side is in the shadows, creating that nice look and contrast. And then we also have lines. So similar to the first dune image that I showed, we have lines in the Badlands kind of coming down to meet in the center of the image in that little gully. Um, so with that, as your eyes come through the frame and down towards the middle, they're immediately pushed up by looking at those lines and it takes you back up to the top of the frame where then the eyes kind of travel back around to the other side. So we always want to kind of keep that energy and that flow going with our eyes and that's really what we're looking for with our prompts. So here are the two alternative compositions that I had. You can see the one on the left. Um, I really liked it. I was focusing on that ridge that I liked so much and these are both raw files. Um, but then I had this little distraction over here of this gully with the flowers. And even though I've been known to clone out upwards of to 200 dust spots on my sensor in, in Photoshop, um, I'm not quite that liberal with cloning out major details. So I didn't want to just clone out this little squiggle line of the gully here. So I moved a little bit further over to the right to see what I could achieve. And now you can see that my beloved ridge line is kind of taking us way off on the left. And so your eyes kind of ignore what what's going on over here because you're immediately drawn to the curve of this ridge. So I went ahead and came and took more steps back to the right and eventually centered on the composition that we see here. And I liked that this ridge kind of seemed to be embracing the topography here in the landscape. So this image didn't have a lot of contrast to begin with. It's a very soft image. So you can see here my processing is pretty minimal here in Lightroom. Um, I brought my whites up a bit. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much about it. Highlights, I brought them up a bit. I have a pretty nice histogram here and my tone curve, not too much going on because again, it's not an image with a lot of contrast. So the image on the right here is what I came out with after Lightroom and then I took it into Photoshop to accentuate my mid-tone contrast with a layer. I cloned out a few little spots at the top here doing border control. And there was one little spot over here that I didn't like. So I just cropped in a little bit, got rid of those distractions and that's my final image. So those are my three case studies. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to Sarah. All right. Is the right screen sharing? Yes, it is. Wait, now I see you. Let me try again. Now it should be the right one. Yes, you're good. Okay. Sounds good. So I'm going to amplify a lot of what David and Jennifer have had to say just through different types of photographs. So these are the three case studies that I'm going to be doing, uh, but quickly before uh, going into those, I'll give a kind of a broader overview of how I look at composition and then I'll go into the details. 
And all of these ideas, if I can get my mouse to advance things. So all of these ideas come from, uh, or are related to the composition concepts and lessons that I talk about in my new ebook, which is 11 composition lessons for photographing nature's smaller scenes. And I'll talk a little bit more about this at the end. So my nature, or, or my photographs of small scenes fall into three categories. So from the three categories, I decided to choose a case study from each one. And the first is intimate landscapes. And I think of these as compositions that encompass a narrow field of view that falls, some, that falls somewhere between a grand landscape and a macro photograph. So this is often about arranging smaller details from within a much larger scene. The second kind of photos that I take a lot of are portraits of plants and flowers. And this often includes focusing on a single plant or a small grouping of plants, and then excluding a lot of the surrounding context. And then the third kind of photos that I take in terms of small scenes would be abstract renditions of natural subjects. And these often go beyond the, a subject's literal qualities and instead focus on abstractions like shapes and patterns and textures and light and motion. Uh, sometimes the subject is recognizable and sometimes it's not. So I'll go through one example for each of those types of small scenes. Uh, generally, I think about composition as starting from this point, where composition, the light that you're working with, and the subject that you select come together to create a photograph. But the thing that it's always filtered through is your vision and how you see the world. So before I go into some of my examples, I thought it would be helpful to talk about how I organize my photography through my compositions. Um, and that's the first word that I just used, organize is I really like to organize chaos. I really seek out qualities like harmony and elegance and grace. So taking a really chaotic scene in nature and then finding a way to organize it and present it with those ideas in mind that elevates the harmony, grace, and elegance, that's one of the things that I think comes out a lot in my compositions. Uh, like David was talking about and Jennifer talked about as well around simplicity that uh, that's another one of the main hallmarks of my approach to nature photography. And then I, I always like to find order. So my mind is super busy and I'm all over the place in terms of my mind. And I think photography allows me to find order and organize the world in front of me. So one of the ways that plays out a lot is I find a lot of uh, compositions that are pretty symmetrical and I center my compositions. So if you've ever taken a photography class you hear that centered compositions are boring. Well, in my world, centered compositions are harmonious. So that's my vision for how I want to present nature. So that's why I do things like find symmetry and centered compositions. So I think as like, especially how Jennifer was talking about how we don't want to focus so much on rules, but instead concepts, I think that's a great example of how uh, in some cases rules might not align with your vision. So focus on your vision instead. So now I will talk about five essential ideas that I've, I think are important for photographing nature's small scenes. And as I talk about these, I'm not necessarily thinking about these really deliberately when I'm out photographing. It's more ideas that have become intuitive over time. So practice helps be able, or practice has helped me be able to see these things in nature and then apply them as I'm working on a composition in a way that just feels completely natural and intuitive. So the first is abstraction. And by this, I mean seeing beyond the literal subject that's in front of you. So here we see sand dunes, but we actually see lines and curves and light. So those kinds of abstractions are actually building blocks of composition. So all of these building blocks here that you see on the screen, those are things that once you start noticing and seeing them, those become the basis of a composition. So the more that you can see these kinds of abstractions, the more tools and ideas that you have to apply in terms of creating a composition. Uh, the next is exclusion, where eliminating context can help elevate the power of your subject. So here, I feel like if I had included the top of the Joshua tree, that would dilute the relationships that you see between the main tree and then the two secondary trees and then the third layer of trees even further behind. So by really focusing on 
the main tree and the two other secondary trees, I was able to elevate that relationship. So excluding all of that context was really an essential part of the composition. So I, I think about exclusion a lot in my photography. And then simplification, since all three of us have talked about simplification, I won't go into a lot of detail, but generally the idea of choosing a core concept for a photograph and then really focusing in on that concept and excluding some of the, the additional context or additional detail uh, out that might dilute your main subject. Uh, structure is one of the main ways that I think about organizing chaos. And I think of structure as scaffolding for a photograph. So in some of the, in the three case studies that, we'll, uh, that I'll talk through, each of them have a structure that helps organize the chaos of nature into a cohesive composition. And in this case, the lines of the trees are a really obvious form of structure. And then maybe a less obvious form is the light that's on the edge of each of those trees, because that helps add depth and uh, makes the tree stand out from the background. So the, or the tree trunks and the light are both examples of structure and how that organizes chaos in nature. And then with all photographs of small scenes, details are especially important. So this little patch of uh, alpine plants was probably six or seven inches across. And when you're photographing such small scenes, it's really important to pay attention to details, like how things enter and exit your frame. Are there any bare patches? Is there dirt or debris or other things that would create a visual distraction? So those are my five essential ideas that really drive my composition. So abstraction, simplification, exclusion, structure, and details matter. And now we'll actually talk about three example photographs. So again, an intimate landscape, an abstract, and a portrait of plants. So the first example, uh, this is from a really misty day up at Mount Rainier National Park. And if you have ever heard me talk about composition, you've probably seen this photograph before. And I keep coming back to it because I feel like it's such a great learning opportunity to talk through this photograph. So um, it's just, and it, it, it was such, such a magical scene because being from Colorado, we just don't have fog that much. So it was just exciting to actually be in a foggy atmosphere and be able to photograph under those circumstances. Um, I think a lot of, or there's often a perception that macro lenses and telephoto lenses are the main photos or the main lenses that you use to take photos of small scenes. And pretty much all of my examples are either wide angle or kind of mid range zoom. So like, I think the next one is 58 millimeters. This one's 28. So you can use wider lenses like Jennifer was mentioning to take photos of smaller scenes. So some of the composition concepts that we'll talk about in this example, so shapes, repetition, layers, and balance. And repetition, or layers are a type of repetition as well. So here are three alternative compositions, and one was facing one way on the trail, and then the other was turning around and facing the other way. And while I think all three of these are okay, uh, I will mention a couple of things that just catch my eyes, things that I don't necessarily like. So in the first two, so the left and then the middle, that, that really big bright rock catches a lot of attention. And I think it takes away from the rest of the scene because it's not terribly interesting, it's really bright. Uh, that's something that you could darken in processing, but I think overall it just pulls away from the more interesting parts of the scene. And then in the middle one, there's a plant that's intruding on the lower edge that's a lot brighter and different than the rest of the scene. So it's another example of something that pulls my eye. Uh, in the example on the right, I feel like the, uh, the fluffy plant in the lower left is a little bit too close to the edge and it, it draws too much attention. Of the three here, that's probably the one that I would consider the best, uh, but I feel like the, the composition that I ended up choosing to process is significantly better than any of these three. So shapes and repetition. So instead of seeing trees and wildflowers and mist, we see a lot of different shapes and different repetition. And then we can use these abstractions to organize a composition. So first we have the small yellow triangles in the background and those are all a little bit misty. Since the mist, they are a little bit softer. 
And then we have the more dominant trees kind of in the middle ground. And then we have lots of repeating wildflowers. So we can think of two different types of triangles and then circular plants as things that we can use to organize the chaos of nature into a more cohesive composition. So when you start seeing abstractions like this, you can start, you ha start having more tools to organize the chaos of nature. Another thing I think, uh, another thing that I think about a lot is balance. And there are lots of different ways to think about balance. I think one of the main reasons I'm drawn to balanced compositions is because they're harmonious and uh, they feel calming versus uh, unbalanced compositions can feel more dynamic and that's not necessarily my goal through my photography. So here when we split this composition into a grid, each of the upper right quadrant or the upper right quadrant and the upper left quadrant both feel fairly equal in terms of the number of subjects in their arrangement. And then the lower two quadrants also feel pretty similar. But we can also think about balance in a different way where we have the three groups of trees in the back and then we have the two groups of trees in the midground, and then we have a pretty even arrangement of flowers in the foreground. So that's another way to think about balance. And in this particular case, I feel like especially the way that the trees are arranged helps add harmony to this particular scene. Uh, if the, say the tree in the midground on the right overlapped the tree in the background on the right, if those two things were overlapping, we wouldn't get the same amount of depth. It might feel tense and less pleasant, less visually pleasant. So by arranging those things so that they were tapered, uh, that brings balance to the composition. So here's a another view of that photograph without all the little drawings on it. So here's example number two. And Jennifer and I are both obsessed with mud tiles. And David has a lot of nice mud tiles as well. He just doesn't express his obsession as verbally as Jennifer and I do. Uh, but this is uh, some wet mud. So it had rained and then the, the mud got wet and smoothed out the surface, which made it even more reflective. So I took this in Death Valley National Park. And uh, you can see the technical information below. This was taken at twilight, so well after sunset. And because the tiles were really reflective, they picked up the blues and pinks of, of the light that was in the sky that day. So here are three alternative compositions. And I actually like the one in the upper right. I pr that's a, a TIFF file that I've processed. I think it still needs some work, but I like the transition between the two. And then the other two, I really don't feel like they have any anything that pulls them together. I think they, they're just of some photos of some mud tiles. I don't feel like they really have a design to them. So for the photo that I did process, these are the composition concepts that I used. So balance, uh, this, filling the frame with the subject, having some visual flow. I paid attention to the edges, so how things enter and exit, and then really focusing on simplicity. So we'll go back to the grid again. So this is an, another example of how you can think about balance, especially for an abstract like this. The tiles look pretty similar in terms of their arrangement, how large they are, uh, the way that they're flowing in all four of the quadrants. So that helps add balance to a scene like this. I also filled the frame so that it feels like the tiles extend well beyond all four of the edges. So that's another thing that I like thinking about a lot is I want it to feel like my photograph continues beyond the scene. Uh, that there's probably a distraction right on one of the edges that I wanted to eliminate, but the viewer doesn't need to know that. So by excluding some additional context uh, and really focusing on visually similar tiles, I think it elevates the message and makes the composition more cohesive. And then in this photograph, I, I really like this pretty, uh, the line that kind of forms an S through the middle because I think it suggests some flow. So when I think about flow, it's kind of how the scene moves and how your eye moves through the scene. And I think this line that goes through the middle of the composition, so it kind of sw swoops up and then swoops down and then swoops out. Uh, and then the tiles on the left kind of feel like they're moving up and the tiles on the right kind of feel like they're moving down that those things together uh, elevate this composition in terms of just being more interesting and more dynamic 
than those other two examples that I showed before. So I feel like this, this S that you see, and you can see it here without the, the diagrams, that that S really helps organize this photograph. So that would be an example of structure, where the S through the frame helps organize the chaos and add some scaffolding to the composition. And then here's example number three, and these are corn lilies taken in uh, right nearby my house in southwestern Colorado. Uh, so 35 millimeters, so again, a pretty wide scene. So I'm looking straight down onto these plants uh, as much as possible. And you'll see a couple of ex other examples here. The first example up in the left is just a disaster. I included that to show like, that I have no idea what's going on. That's just another photo of some corn lilies with no organizing principle. Uh, the example on the upper right gets closer to what I'm, I'm after and what my final photograph looks like. But those two corn lilies, it's kind of like the two in the lower right are competing against the three in the upper left, and the two in the lower right just aren't very attractive. So I just feel like, like there's just not enough cohesiveness between the individual plants. And then for the bottom two, I really like both of those. I haven't processed either of them, but I think the concept works. So the idea of looking down at a much wider angle, probably 16 millimeters, and getting a real sense of the expansiveness, and then the other looking on towards the field of corn lilies with a telephoto lens and getting a different view of the expansiveness. Um, so just a, a, some examples of how the repetition in these plants, you can think about composition in a couple of different ways. So the composition concepts here, so I centered my subjects, uh, the shapes that are inherent in the scene, and then how I organized them, paying attention to excluding context and the edges, and then processing amplifies the composition. And another thing that I'd put on this list is repetition as well. Repetition is another huge theme in my work. So first we have these three central corn lilies. So we can see that is kind of encompassed by this circle. But then we also have triangles. So how those three triangles are oriented with relation to each of the four edges was one of the most important composition decisions for this photo. So figuring out how I wanted them each to flow, uh, because if I say I shifted to my right a little bit, that would change the orientation. And it, so if the two bottom corn lilies were more along the edge, that would be more static, whereas kind of offset adds a little bit more of di a more dynamic composition. Again, filling the frame so it feels like the corn lilies extend in every direction and excluding any distractions on the edges. So I likely chose this composition because there were things on the edges that I didn't necessarily want to include because they pulled attention away from the three primary plants. And then as David explained, and then Jennifer also had a couple of examples of how processing can really amplify a composition. That's definitely the case in this example. So here you can see a very lightly processed version on the left. And when you don't have the darkening around the edges, the, it compete, the things are then, or the other corn lilies compete for attention. So you can see those three pink arrows. Those three plants compete for the attention of the three in the middle. So by darkening, as you can see on the right, darkening the plants around the edges helps amplify the three in the middle. So we don't have that competition for attention anymore because we've elevated those three as the main subject of our photograph. And then by darkening the other plants, we've moved them down to a secondary subject. And then you can see the final version of that photograph here. And then as I've mentioned, I have this new ebook, which was, it actually started out as five lessons for photographing nature's small scenes for David's Nature Photographers Network site. And now it's a 131 page ebook. So um, I'm really glad that instead of releasing it as an article, I really, I'm releasing it as an ebook because I could go into a lot more uh, depth. And then I have like 160 examples, both things that work and things that don't. So it's a 131 page ebook a field guide for your phone, so a 21 page field guide that you can use on your phone that has the more most important things that you can then use when you're out in nature photographing. And then there is 70 minutes of video case studies to help bring the ideas to life. So 
with that, we can move on to questions. Oh, and I will mention you can, if you are interested, you can go to our website at naturephotoguides.com and it's $24.95 for a few more days until I raise the price um, after the release. So with that, we can go to questions now. Thanks, Sarah. We have a ton of questions. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of them are really specific um, to each person. So um, I don't know if one of you wants to ask the questions towards me first or. Okay. And I just also want to say I answered a few of you guys in the question and answer chat. I just typed you guys an answer. So be sure you go in and check on that just so we can breeze through these questions a little more easily. But um, don't be afraid or don't forget to look there because I did answer some questions. Um, okay, David, so you want me to kind of shoot some? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, actually, I'll just, yeah, I'll kind of do this. Um, so Sarah, actually, I'll start with Sarah. Do you, Jim wants to know, do you analyze the scene with all the factors you use before you shoot or when you are looking at your images after you shoot? I went through a process of doing this really deliberately out in nature where I was trying to think like, I, what leading lines do I see? What repetition do I see? What visual design principles do I see? And I don't do that anymore now that I've learned all these things. I feel like they're much more intuitive, uh, but I generally notice these things when I'm photographing. Um, it's just things that come naturally and then I use them to organize the scene just kind of based again on intuition. And then when I'm deciding on a composition to process, I think that's when I start being more deliberate about analyzing things, like being like really thinking through like, does this composition work better in these ways or does this, composition work better uh, based on some of the uh, like actually putting more words to what doesn't work or what does work. So I, I think it, it's different based on my time in the field and my time at the computer. But I, I think the bottom line is that with practice, a lot of these things become intuitive. Definitely. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Um, David, here's one for you from Mark. Um, he wants to know, and I'm laughing at this because I know David's answer and he better get it right. Um, he says, David, did you come across the backlit tree scene accidentally or did you plan to be there at a certain time knowing this image was possible? Oh yeah, completely found that on my own. <laughs> no, actually, um, I have to give Jennifer some credit because she actually noticed that. Um, we were driving around one morning and we caught the very last light and Jennifer noticed that um, the light would look really nice, uh, really nice on that tree, um, but we were just a little bit late that morning. so. We actually planned to come back the next day and we got there really early before the sun hit it so that we could see exactly what happened throughout the morning. And um, I can answer some other questions about that too, because the, a lot of people ask um, how long the light lasted because how did I get all those different compositions on that same tree? And I actually don't know the answer to that. Usually the light is so fleeting in those moments, but for some reason the light just hung on that morning and we probably had a good half hour where we were shooting that tree from all different angles. So I don't know if it was maybe the trees up higher on the hill that were kind of filtering the light or something. But yeah, there was a lot of time to work with it. Um, there was like some really specific moments of great light where it was not hitting other trees. And so, yeah. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and toss one to me. Um, so Bruce wanted to know, on the dunes, you did not expand the histogram towards the light and dark ends. Were you emphasizing the softness of the scene? Did you try this shot with the expanded histogram for stronger contrast also? And I know that there's another question um, someone asked kind of along the same lines. Jane wanted to know that, or she noticed that my histograms don't touch edge to edge, and she didn't know that that was acceptable. She thought you had to set a white and a black point when processing a photo, and she would love to know or be happy to find out that this isn't true. So I'm gonna to try to answer both of those. Um, and if anyone, if you guys wanna chime in on that, on Jane's question as well, when I'm done, please go for it. Um, so Bruce, so yes. So sand dune images to me, I it's a personal creative choice, but I really enjoy my sand dunes to be softer, more pastel. Um, unless I'm working with black and white, I don't generally like a lot of contrast. Um, I know people love to see those golden dunes with those sharp shadows, but I'm really more of a pastel dunes person. Um, so I try to keep, you know, my histograms are usually almost kind of balanced in the middle. I'm not pushing them off 
to be underexposed or overexposed. Um, I just don't like a lot of contrast in my dunes. So I didn't try that particular image with more contrast because I liked it pretty much the way it was. Um, and so, and then to answer Jane's question, yeah, I, I honestly, I, I don't set a black and a white point. Um, I just kind of go out and shoot. And I was never taught that. I know that now, um, I know just from talking to some people, a lot of beginners are taught to do that. Um, I just, I'm not a technical person. <laughs> um, I just kind of do what I do because I've, I've learned from trial and error and just my own creative choices. Um, so I know that probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I hope that kind of answers your question, but Sarah, David, do you want to chime in on the black and the white points? Um, yeah, I think this is a really important point because a lot of instructors, um, when they're teaching Lightroom and Photoshop, tell you that one of the first things you should do is set your black and white points. Um, and I think that's just terrible advice, no offense to them, but um, <laughs> uh, there's so many opportunities to create so many different images. And when you set your black and white points as the first thing you do, you're just immediately creating something that's really high contrast, and then you have no choices to go any other direction. So that's something that you might set at the very end um, to really bring out that contrast. But if you're wanting something that's softer and has less contrast, then no, absolutely. I, I don't set black and white points terribly often myself. Um, I, I personally like to work more with the midtones and that's kind of opposite from how that works. So um, yeah, you definitely don't have to have your histogram touching on each side to make a good image. I think this is just a general lesson that it's really helpful to learn, like, what does it mean to set your black and white points? What does it mean to use the rule of thirds? And then you can decide how to apply those lessons based on what you see in front of you. Sometimes it makes sense to set your black and white points, like right touching on the edges of the histogram. Like if you want a really high contrast black and white scene as an example, uh, but if you want a really soft photo, like we've all showed really low contrast photos today, a couple of examples of lower contrast photos. And I think that's because that was our vision for that scene. So in that case, it doesn't make sense to set the black and white points. Yeah. So I think it's more important to learn these ideas and then think about how to apply them based on the specific situation in front of you. Yeah. If somebody tells you to do one specific thing for every single image, just run away. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jane, for that question, though. That was a very good question. Um, all right, so let's go back to David here. So Ed would like to know, on your backlit Aspen, um, did you, why did you push the tone curve lights rather than the whites in the develop module? And what are the relative differences of these two in terms of boosting the lights tones? Yeah, that's something new I've been working on since the last saw you, Ed. Um, I'd like to pull up the lights in the tone curve because um, it, really works with the midtones instead of working on the extreme ends. So again, not trying to create that super high contrast from the start. So I typically work with um, pulling out those lights in the, the midtones with the tone curve first. And then if I can't achieve enough contrast that I want, then I'll use the whites to bring out that extra bit of contrast. But I always try the tone curve first to pull it out that way because I can usually get a lot you know, it's a lot nicer tonality of contrast than um, just pulling up the whites, which can often clip things. So hopefully that makes sense. It's kind of hard to explain, but. <laughs> All right, and then here's a few for Sarah. Um, regarding your corn lilies image, Sarah, um, I just lost it, there it is. Um, one would like to know if you used a vignette on the corn lilies. Uh, yes, but not applied uniformly. So say in Lightroom, you think of the vignette and it's the example that I showed with the blue circle around it where it applies it like an oval. Well, but those corn lilies aren't oval. So I, do, I want to then instead go in and do a really fine tuned vignette where I'm darkening, I'm using dodge and burn tools to burn down or darken very specific parts of the scene. So yes, it is an effective vignette, but it's a very targeted specific vignette to the, the plants and leaves that I, I want to minimize. Uh, I want to send them back to the background by darkening them. Uh, so it's saying this leaf needs to be addressed, like this edge on this leaf. So really focused and detailed enhancements. 
Okay. And then Mark would like to know, when you're rendering in black and white, do you feel more restricted or how do you change your mindset compared to your approach with a color image? I feel so much more free with black and white. <laughs> um, I feel like there's, you're just starting from a place of where there's not real, any realism whatsoever other than your subject occurred in nature. We don't see in black and white, so it gives you a, a totally different place to start. And if I were showing you before and after examples of my black and white photos compared to my color, I go much further in terms of processing and personal vision with my black and white photos. So I personally feel a lot more creative freedom when working in black and white. All right. Thank you, Sarah. And here's one for all three of us that we can answer pretty quickly. Um, Kevin just wants to know if any of us are traditionally trained arts or graphic design, et cetera, um, or, has we, or have we all learned as part of our journey? Um, I'll start. I have no training in photography at all. Um, I loved art in school. Um, I sketched a lot. I painted a lot. Um, I kind of lost track of that as I went into college, but I, I've taken a few photography classes as an adult, but no classically trained, just reading everything that I can, watching YouTube videos, and just learning from trial and error in the field for me. Same here. I have no formal training. I um, just totally self-taught um, everything online or books. Um, yeah, I'm just really passionate about it and learn as much as I can. I'm also mostly self-taught. Uh, I have found vi uh, visual design references for graphic designers to actually be really helpful in putting some of the ideas. So let's say I've read a composition book on from a photographer and then reading a visual design book from a graphic designer. I think that actually helped me understand some of the principles a lot more deeply. So uh, there were three visual design or graphic design books that I found especially helpful as I was trying to learn how to put my composition ideas into words. So even, I have never taken a class. I just found a couple books that were helpful. Okay. Um, and then someone asked with your fog image, Sarah, why a polarizer in the fog and beautiful image? Well, thank you for the compliment. Uh, anytime anything is wet, so anytime like a, the, all those wildflowers were wet and the trees were wet. So if you were to not use a polarizer, you could get glare on a lot of those leaves, especially. So using a polarizer helps remove some of the glare and darken or deepen some of the colors. So in some circumstances, like if it's raining and the polarizer is just getting wet and having to wipe it all the time and it's fogging up, then I might take it off. But in that particular situation, there the polarizer helped a lot and there was no technical complexity of using it. So anytime you're photographing leaves that are a little bit waxy or they, you can see on your LCD that they have a little bit of glare to them or they're wet, it can always be helpful to just test out a polarizer and see what it might do. Okay, um, here's one for David. Um, I'll just throw this your way since you talked a lot about simplification. Um, Jerry would like to know, how do you distinguish between exclusion and simplification? They seem to be very similar. Can you provide examples of each? Um, yeah, I think they're extremely similar. Um, I think you achieve simpli simplification by exclusion. So just by removing elements from the frame, you just achieve simplification naturally. Um, I don't know how else to explain that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm just scrolling through here. We have so many questions. Um, Do you want me to ask the questions for a few, Jennifer? So you don't have to go for it. <laughs> okay. Since you always get tasked with the questions, it's not <laughs> always fair. Let's see. So what does it mean to process a photo in high key? David's photo is a great example. Yeah. Yeah, so um, high key is just um, kind of processing it extremely bright um, to where there's almost no detail and um, very little shadow detail. So it's just really just processing it so intentionally to make things really bright and not having a lot of detail. And that's I think the easiest way to explain it. <laughs> uh, how about Jennifer? On the wide angle shot with the flowers, did you try a variety of tripod heights to move the horizon away from the center of the image? So on that one, I actually didn't. I think I might have tried one shot um, at eye level, 
and then quickly realized they needed to go down a little lower, but the sun star was, well, the sun was rising really quickly. And when you're in a situation like that, trying to catch the sun star, it's crazy fast how fast the sun actually moves. Um, so to save time and just make, to make sure I didn't really miss the sun star, um, I kept it pretty much like medium height, um, kind of hip height. Um, and didn't really get a chance to play with my horizon. I know that I preach slow photography. Um, mm -hmm. This is a case where it was not slow photography because I saw the shadow lines and the sun star, so I just really wanted to get on it. So it was one of those random times for me. Um, but no, in that case, I did not have a chance to really play with my tripod height. Great. Uh, how about you, David? Uh, do, you, you, do you use the view card in the field before you shoot on the image after you are ready to work on it or both? Uh, it's really intended to be used in the field. Um, in post-processing, you can just use the crop tool to test out different things like that. So yeah, it's really meant to be used in the field. Let's see. There's a question about vignetting, and I think we covered that, that you can use vignetting to draw the eye to the center or to some part of a photograph. So vignetting is essentially selective darkening so that then that allows other things to move forward visually. Um, how about on aspect ratios to either one of you? Uh, when, you when you're thinking about aspect ratios, do you choose it for the overall impact on the composition and fine tuning when cropping? So do either of you have thoughts on aspect ratios and composition? I think um, the aspect ratio is really important to the composition. And I actually wish that you could set more aspect ratios in camera so that you could try those out in the field. Um, Cause a lot of times it's hard to visualize those. Um, I know mine only does like square and 16 by nine. So I wish I had more options for that, but um, yeah, it helps determine what your composition is going to be. So I try to see those things out in the field. Um, it doesn't always work out. Um, I often try to think in more like four by five um, is kind of a ratio that I like. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely try different crops afterwards to try different aspect ratios and see if they work better for the composition. Yeah, I really can't add anything to what David said, so. Okay. Yeah. I think this is a great question about creative process. So do you ever get locked up with all of these thoughts and concepts and lose some creativity or does time in the field just help you apply them without so much thought? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I would say that I used to get really caught up in it, trying to think too much about it. And I talk a lot about this in my contemplative presentations about how you activate your prefrontal cortex and it makes you think about these really technical things and then you're no longer creative. So it's really important to get these ideas in your head beforehand um, and um, think about them before. But then when you're out in the field, try not to think about them too much. Just try to wander around and then let those things come to you because if you're thinking too technically, then you can't be creative. Yeah. And I'll just follow up with what David said. Um, yeah. In the beginning, I used to freak out if I didn't have a foreground element, you know, so you arrive on a scene and, you know, sunsets happening or the sunrise and you're like, Oh my gosh, I need a rock or I need a tree stump or something. And I used to get so stressed about that um, because that's what we're taught. I mean, we all, you know, in our beginner photography courses, we're all taught, you know, you find a foreground element that's your anchor for the scene. So your eye has something to start on and move through the scene with. Um, but then just spending multiple hours in the field, very, very many hours in the field, these concepts, like Sarah mentioned earlier, just intuitively come to you. Um, in fact, when I was going through slides to share with this presentation, I was a little, I was getting a little frustrated because I actually didn't have a lot of images where I had multiple alternative compositions. And in fact, I told David, I said, oh my gosh, does that mean I, I really don't like preach what I teach in the field? Like, I'm not taking my time. Like, I don't have all these compositions. I usually, you know, I'm so focused. Sometimes I see one that I like and I know that's the one I want and I take it. And he's like, no, it just means, you know, you've been doing this long enough now that sometimes you see things. And of course, I still experiment with different compositions, but, um, you know, it's something that I can relate with. Um, but yeah, a lot of it just comes with just practice and time in the field and these things just eventually kind of come to you and your eyes just, they're trained to see that way. Yes, practice, 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 so that it becomes intuitive and you don't have to think about these things. 
Um, I think we talked mostly about polarizers. So do people use polarizers for small landscapes and or mostly uh, close ups of plants. So I think the quick answer to that is that you can use a polarizer for all different kinds of scenes. It's really the quality that you're looking for. Like, do you want to remove glare or do you want to saturate colors? Uh, do you want to enhance a sky? Like thinking about those are some of the things you can use a polarizer for and then analyze your situation to say, should, could it be useful in this scene? So it can be useful for all kinds of scenes, um, not just for small scenes or big scenes. Do either of you guys have any thoughts on that that you want to add? No. Sorry, I was answering qu other questions. I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> okay. No, I could. David doesn't have anything to add. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, we talked about black and white points. So I'll, we appreciation for dispelling the black or the setting the black and white points. So that's a good one. Yes. Um, so do we? think there's a difference between small scenes and intimate landscapes. And then there was another question about Elliot Porter's and Charlotte Gibb talking about uh, uh, intimate landscapes versus what we're talking about as small scenes. So, I, think, I think Sarah kind of covered that at the beginning of yours is that small scenes can kind of fall under all those different categories of like the plants and all sorts of different things versus the intimate landscape is more about um, you know, finding a small portion of, of the grand landscape and focusing in on that. Um, I don't know, they might be considered largely the same thing, but I feel like there's a little bit of a difference there possibly. Yeah, I, I also would think about like intimate landscapes as kind of a broader category. And then as you get down, like abstracts is a pretty specific category. Mm -hmm. um, so you could think about it in that way too. But like Charlotte, some of her intimate landscapes are also, also have a lot of abstractions in them. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it's just helpful to think about these as, as idea generators, not as firm categories that you need to fit in. So we just use small scenes to designate when we're doing these webinars of things that we're not talking about grand landscapes. I think that's more why we use the small scenes. I don't want to speak for David and Jennifer, but I think that's kind of the thinking behind it. No, I totally agree. Uh, Mark has a question for David about if he was to make his own field of view card, uh, would he cut frames in various aspect ratios or like kind of where do you start with something like that? Yeah, if you were to cut your own, then you'd make several different ones if you like to shoot in different aspect ratios. Some people like to just shoot in square all the time and others two to three. So yeah, just whatever, you know, cut or aspect ratios you like to use, then I would cut those out in that size. And you can make them different sizes. Some people like to go pretty large with theirs and I've seen others that are really small. So it's kind of up to you. You'll have to experiment and see what works best for you. So how do you guys use your histogram when you're out in the field? I, I pull mine up on my, um, on my LCD um, even before I shoot um, because I have a, I have a mirrorless camera so I can even see it through the viewfinder and um, I just evaluate it and make sure that nothing is clipping on the right side so towards the the highlights um, that's usually what's most important to me is I usually expose a little bit more to the right um, but just making sure those highlights don't clip so and then I if it's a really high contrast scene then I'll just make sure that I take additional exposures if I need to blend anything and I just evaluate that if I have like tons of information on each side of the histogram, then I know I might need to bracket that. Yeah. And I'll just save time and say that pretty much everything David said is what I do in the field as well. So David, how much do you use the radial filter versus global adjustments in Lightroom when you're adjusting the focal point of your photographs? Um, I use the radial filter quite a bit. It's a really fun tool to um, help you draw attention to certain areas. And um, I use that, um, I've been using the, uh, the adjustment brush a lot more now that I've got the Wacom tablet. Um, so I have a lot finer control of what, where I'm burning and dodging. So I can apply really specific adjustments to certain areas. Um, so I use both of those quite a bit now. All right. I'm trying to get the specific ones done first and then we can go to the broader ones. 
Most often I shoot wide. Then when processing, I discover the better composition results from sometimes a surprisingly significant crop. Does this happen to anyone else besides me? <laughs> I'll say it happens to me a lot. Um, and I'm not afraid to crop. If you've seen our other webinars, I'll say that you know, cropping does not bother me. Um, but that does happen, you know, and, and in the field, I try to look for those little moments, but sometimes you just, you take a wide angle shot, you get it home and you say, oh, look at all these little stories in this wider image. Um, and I have cropped down on them. I mean, we're, I can't speak for you, but I mean, I'm, I'm not putting my images on a giant billboard and I'm pretty content with my 20 megapixels on my camera. I know so many people out there would be horrified at that number, but it's worked just fine for me. So I, I'm not afraid to crop because sometimes you do see something that you couldn't see in the field at the time. And, you know, if you can run with that image and still process it and it makes you happy and it's what you wanted to show, then by all means go for it. I, I say I've gotten better about um, changing lenses in the field to really dial in on the composition that I want. Um, but I will still crop. Sometimes I'll you know, find something within a scene too. I'm kind of the opposite. I crop maybe 2% of the time. Wow. So I'm pretty <laughs> deliberate with my, like sometimes I, I, I crop off the edges a little bit, but I almost never crop like to create a different composition. So I, I guess it's just being obsessive in the field maybe, which I think probably I could be a little less obsessive about that kind of thing. So, but this is why we're doing this, three different perspectives. That's right. <laughs> um, a question about grad, graduated neutral density filters, um, which isn't directly related to anything we're talking about today as much, but um, do you ever use filters to even out the light intensity differences in a single shot, such as a bright sky versus a dark, dark foreground, or do we shoot multiple shots and blend them? Just say we all do not use grads. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we all blend. Yeah. That was an easy one. Uh, what lens do you recommend for nature photography for a cropped sensor camera? What, uh, sorry, I missed the first part, was it? Uh, what lens do you recommend for nature photography for a cropped sensor camera? Oh, um, I, you know, I shoot with a crop um, with my Fuji and I usually shoot with uh, like the 50 to 140, which is equivalent to 70 to 200, or the 100 to 400, which is equivalent to 150 to 600. But I also shoot with the 16 to 35 and the 10 to 24 for small scenes as well. So really you can shoot a small scene with any range of lenses, but uh, it's mostly the, mostly the telephotos that I use. Same I, I shoot with a crop and it's mostly telephoto lenses. There's I think oh, nowadays. I think all of us would would probably say telephoto would be a place to start for these kinds of photos, but I think the key is that what interests you most. Mm -hmm. So that we all like telephoto stuff. So that might be our first recommendation, but it really depends on what what you're most interested in. <sighs> Uh, let's see. Did you analyze the images you presented specifically for the webinar or were you mindful enough in the moment to identify the aspects you highlight? And then what helps you stay mindful? So slowing down and taking the time for things to look or taking time to look for these things. I'd say it's a mix of, um, you know, sometimes we're very mindful in the field of you know, finding these compositions and sometimes then we just see them later on when we're looking at them. And a lot of times in the field, like, like I said before, I'm not thinking about really thinking about compositions. I'm just being open to seeing things. And that kind of goes with the mindfulness is um, just being open in the field to seeing what's around you. So not actively seeking something out, just you know, being open to, noticing those things that really grab your interest and make you say, wow. So that's my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, do you have anything to add? No, I, I mean, that's very similar to an answer that I would have. 
but yeah, just keep that open mind. We have seven more questions, so I could ask each of you and we could get, try to get through them all quickly. So uh, David, do you prefer Lightroom over Photoshop and do you offer training? Um, I do a mix of Lightroom and Photoshop. So I've um, gone back and forth over the years of what I like to use and it's just come down to a mix. Um, there's very specific things you can do in Photoshop and have a lot more control, but if you don't want to, you can do most of what you need in Lightroom. Um, I do have some videos on our website on exploring exposure. Um, some of the more recent ones would be your best bet. Um, so I have one like called colors, colors and tones where I go deeper into a lot of the stuff that I talked about here. So you can check that out if you want to learn more. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer, how do you find locations in your area? So I really don't do a whole lot of research to areas where I go anymore. Um, and to be fair, a lot of our locations that we go to, um, we visit every single year um, during different seasons. So I, I have a pretty good base of knowledge. Um, but I think this is a common theme with all of us. It's all about exploring. Um, very rarely do I go out and look for a specific location. Um, it's really just for me about getting out on a trail, off the beaten path, just kind of seeing what I see and what nature gives me that day. I, I know it sounds a little hippy dippy, but that's really, that's how I come across 90% of my imagery is just going out, exploring, being curious, observing, um, getting to know an area and learning the weather patterns and experimenting in different seasons and weather patterns. Um, so yeah, it's, I don't really, you know, if, if, it, if I'm going somewhere that I don't know, I mean, for safety reasons, you know, we'll obviously do a little bit of research, but as far as photographing, it's been a long time since I've had, you know, I'm going to go to the Grand Tetons and to, you know, Schwabacher's Landing and get this shot. Um, nowadays, it's, well, I might go to Schwabacher's, but I might actually wander a quarter mile this way or a half mile this way and see what I can see and observe. Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Great. This one's for me. Uh, Sarah, when you were analyzing the example with the trees, did you notice and reject the images with the rock that was calling too much attention? Or are these the th things that you noticed later at the computer screen? So in that particular example, I tried so many different compositions. of the So the first two compositions that I showed facing one way on the trail, and just it just wasn't working. I couldn't get the trees to line up in the right way. The wildflowers weren't working. There were all these really bright rocks. And then I turned around and focused on the other side of the trail and it was just like, aha, like this works so much better. So I definitely noticed all that stuff at the time. Uh, sometimes though, I definitely notice more once I'm back at home and can see whether or not something works. So I'd say it's a mix of the two. But the more I do this, the more I'm, I recognize this stuff while I'm out photographing. Any more plans for future webinars? We should definitely do some. We don't have any planned right now, but yeah. Yeah, definite in talks to do more. We've just, we've all kind of ridden that high of, you know, being at home and work, work, work. And now that summer's kind of approaching, you know, we, we're chomping up a bit to get out there a little bit, but definitely we'll, we're in talks to definitely do more of these and provide more educational resources because they've been fun. And, you know, it's opened up new doors and opportunities and it's fun to, you know, see you guys on here when we can't get out. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a very positive experience. So yes. And I should mention, um, I do have a webinar planned with uh, John Barclay in July where we're gonna be talking about contemplative photography. So stay tuned. We'll send out an email about that later. I think the main answer is if all of you people want webinars from us, let us know what topics that yeah. you like, because we don't know whether we should continue over the summer or we shouldn't, if we should do a series and ask people to pay for them. Um, so if, if you have feedback or ideas or things that you'd like to see us do, get in touch with one of us so that we can think about it. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Um, how do you recognize when something is overprocessed? Mm, looks fake. <laughs> <laughs> Which, uh, let's be fair, we've all been there. 
I've had over-processed images. David has too. Oh yeah. I have some horrible, horrible images. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> Oxbow Ben that looks a uh, nuclear reaction. <laughs> I have like some easy ways might be really high contrast, really saturated colors, awkwardly bright shadows, like weird highlights, noise, no, yeah. Overuse of HDR. Super fantasy. Like if you're outside yeah. often enough, you know that this kind of stuff does not happen. And if you see that stuff over and over and over, um, where it just looks kind of like unreal. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of images out there that look hyper realistic. Yeah. And I think to me, some of that is when people take away atmospheric perspective and they make everything look sharp and contrasty from foreground to background, mainly talking about like grand landscapes here. But I think that's to me, things look really fake that way because to your eye, when you look through the atmosphere, things as they get farther away lose contrast, they get lighter and so that's one of the ways that i see that <laughs> and one more little um helpful hint um i do this a lot um so if you've been working on an image for an hour or so definitely take the time to step away from it you know take a mental break you know walk away from it for the evening and then the next morning with your coffee or tea you know revisit it and sometimes you'll actually kind of see things that you didn't see the night before because you were so focused on it and your eyes kind of get used to the colors that you're working on at the time um so just a little helpful hint for at home definitely walk away from your image when you're done processing it and just give your eyes a mental break and revisit it with fresh eyes and senses the next day and you'll start to kind of pick up on those things too you'll say what, what was i thinking <laughs> <laughs> Um, Kimberly asked if we do workshops in the Northeast and none of us do workshops in the Northeast. Uh, Kurt Budliger and John Barclay would be two people to talk to about that. Um, Al Marsh asks, do you ever use textures or overlays? No. I don't. That was easy. <laughs> and then Mary, all, if Mary, you're still listening, I can get back to you more about your very specific question. But do any of you or either of you have tips on how to use a really long telephoto lens and get sharp images? Like focusing and just like the, some of the technical challenges of working with a really long lens. No yeah. wind. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no wind. <laughs> well, she had, she was, had a really specific question about um, when you're focused really far or your telephoto is really far out. And it's really hard to focus when you're that far out because things shake when you move it. And that is really, really hard. Um, I've had challenges with that too. Um, you have to be very light with your hand, but it can also help to drape your arm over the lens to kind of stabilize it. Um, because when it's just hanging out there free, it's easy to shake. But if you put your arm on it, and just kind of put some weight on it so that it doesn't move so much, that can help. And a remote or cable release. So a sturdy tripod, like yeah. a tripod that can handle the lens. And don't use a lens hood if it's a little bit windy because that X is kind of a kite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've, I mean, I, I don't want to speak for all of us, but I'm sure we all have the images where we used our super telephotos, came back, and it's just not clear and it's not as sharp as we want. Um, it's challenging. Well, that's the end of our uh, 51 question, no, 62 questions that we either typed answers to or answered live. So um, with that, we're done. All right. <laughs> Thank you guys for joining us today. And I'm so glad to see all these positive comments about how everyone's getting so much out of these because we get a lot out of them too. I mean, we really enjoy doing this for you guys and it's been really fun. So thank if you. It, if there are any topics you wanna see the three of us do together, or if you would be interested in actually doing a series of these with us uh, that you would pay for, uh, let us know that too, because we've talked about that as another option of just doing a, a course on small scenes through this kind of format. So, well, thanks for joining us on a Thursday afternoon to talk about composition. We really appreciate it. <laughs> yes, right. thanks everybody and take care and stay safe and hopefully you guys are slowly making your way out there to start photographing out now that things are start starting to open. So just stay safe and keep in touch and yeah, let us know, drop us a line.
Anything else, David? No, I think that's it. Um, yeah, um, we'll have a discount on our videos too. Um, Sarah will be sending out an email, um, but definitely get Sarah's book. It's great. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for helping me sell since I can't do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you can all expect to receive an email tomorrow morning from us with a recording. Well, it depends on how long it takes to encode the video and everything, but tomorrow you will get an email with a recording and links to other things from both of us and some additional reading you might be interested in. So thanks so much for joining us. Yeah. All right. All Thank right. you, everyone. Bye. Bye.